I was born in Friedberg, Germany in April 1930. Uh, my father was Jewish, my mother was not. Uh, I was raised Jewish. We moved, I was the oldest of three uh, children, and we moved to a small town uh, just west of Darmstadt where my father bought a so-called Kassenpaxis, the socialized medicine of the day. Uh, that was in 1930. In 1933, he lost it to the, to the, new, stat, to the new legislation. So uh, most doctors emigrated from Germany at that time, having lost their livelihood, but he was the only doctor in the village, the town. Uh, it was a somewhat red town, social democrat. So um, a couple of the townsfolk remembered an old mutual benefit life insurance, fire insurance, fire insurance uh, 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 company, and they uh, turned it into a private socialized medicine company. Uh, converted it so that he uh, did the same thing he used to do before. Your patients didn't pay uh, the doctor. They paid into this fund, uh, and I remember the amount exactly. It was one rice mark, 25 pfennig, per household, per month. And as of the age of six, I often collected it by going around to, to, the, um, to the houses. Uh, I knew the people. His practice was, of course, in the house. I got to know. A lot of them, some of them, some of their kids went to school uh, in, the, in the area. Anyway, that's where we uh, grew up. So in 1936, when the uh, Third Reich passed a statute criminalizing uh, the treatment of Aryan patients by Jewish doctors and vice versa, came the big dilemma. Because until then, he still had a living uh, from this. So um, he um, went to Palestine and was getting ready for us to join him in the emigration. Uh, but he was, uh, he, he took terribly ill with a sugarlosis case and a bad amoebic dysentery, and he was hospitalized and uh, sent home. And he kind of lost his feeling that we should go there at that point. So he starts looking for uh, the visas, and he finally found a, a cousin who could uh, provide an affidavit of support for one person. So my father left in the middle of 1938. Uh, by the end of 38, he had, with the help of the uh, UJA, had found some other affidavits of support from well-meaning folks. And so we, we got our visas just uh, before the turn of the year. I was still in a Jewish school in Darmstadt. I, uh, uh, we lived there briefly then. And we went through the crystal night experience. You know, the school was in a synagogue, so it was blown up. Uh, but we continued after that for another month, uh, uh, the schooling, I mean, in a, in a um, little provis provisional uh, thing. But we were able to leave in mid-December. So we got out relatively well, you know, from what was then coming. The trip uh, was memorable. For one thing, it was in the middle of very bad storms, so we were all pretty seasick. And on the third or fourth day, I finally staggered to the dining room, and there were a group of Bavarian uh, sisters uh, who were going back, nuns, who were going back to a, uh, an abbey in, in Kansas or in Nebraska, and they looked at me and said, you know, you don't look good. Are you seasick? And I said, yes. They said, well, here, beer is what helps. So I was not quite nine years old, so uh, I would drink a little beer with every lunch, and believe it or not, it helped. You know, it was, the other big thing was, we left, we weren't allowed to take out any money. So on the uh, ship, my mother would go up to the purser each day. You were allowed to bring, to uh, provide, uh, I think it was 20 marks, Reichmark, and you got four, five dollars for that. So second or third day, she took me along and gave me 20 marks, and I stood there in front of the purser. Uh, you know, I had to look at him. He was way up there at his desk. He looks at me. He shakes his head no, then he looks at me again, then he shakes his head yes. So from then on, we had two people exchanging uh, money. So we arrived in the United States with almost $50, which my father thought was a blessing. In memory of uh, what you left behind, like, or as, as you arrived, what, or like, if you look back, what do you think about what you left behind and how you felt about it? 
Uh, leaving was very difficult for a couple of reasons, and one, of course, tragic reasons, right? Uh, ex with, with the exception of one cousin, none of my father's family got out. And even though I was young and we were, of course, not uh, uh, cognizant of what was going to come, uh, saying goodbye uh, to the aunts and the uncles and the cousins on that side was a pretty, pretty hard thing. I remember that. They, some of them accompanied us in, in Frankfurt to the train station, you know, and they were crying and waving goodbye, and so that stayed with me. And the uh, boat train from Hamburg to Bremerhaven was another one like that. Uh, my mother's twin brother came along, and for me it was a very tense kind of thing. Uh, he, he put me on watch at, at one of the cars to see that nobody was coming in, and then he slipped my mother a diamond ring that she could secrete, uh, you know, on her. So to take her along to have some, something she could sell when we get there. And I remember being both nervous and very pleased that I was part of this transaction. So, they, and of course the biggest thing was uh, leaving that village, you know, even though I was going to the Jewish school in Darmstadt for two of my three years in school, uh, we, we had a very easy time there. I mean, there was no, Nothing overt, you know, the way there was in some other, in some other, and certainly in big cities. You know, he'd been the doctor. He'd been the only doctor. It was something, just okay. You know, we were we were, not, we were not harassed, and not just because my mother was not Jewish. We were just not harassed. The only thing that was different was that, when it came to religious instruction, one year I spent in the Volksschule in Griesheim. The, um, the teacher said, well, we can't have any religious instruction for Jews, so you're just going to have to go outside while this is going on, which of course was wonderful. They were stuck with their catechisms, and I was outside throwing a ball against the wall for half an hour, which was very nice. And they were jealous. They would have preferred not to have to be in the instruction. I, I remember that. We arrived uh, in late December, 38, and after a few days camping out uh, with a cousin in New York, my father found a summer cottage on Long Island Sound that some well-meaning New Haven couple had uh, told the UJA they could use, so we moved there. And uh, it was rather different from the experience of most emigrants. First of all, it was not even a village. I think there were 15 houses in the area. Uh, so you had to uh, uh, adjust very quickly. You know, there wasn't anybody else around to speak German. Uh, and it sounds odd, but uh, in about the third week, when I couldn't understand anything, basically, that was being said in school, I remembered a word that uh, had been uh, used in the, on the playground, guy. And I went home and I asked my father, what does guy mean? And I thought it was something like G-A-I. He realized it was G-U-Y, he knew little English, and he said to me, that means Kel, fellow. And that clicked the conversation in my head that in which the word was used, and this is not a joke. From that next day on, I understood, you know, what was being said. So that made the, of course, you know, you're not, you're just about nine years old, it's easy. So that made that particular change, the language, uh, moved very quickly. What was different was my father had been a country doctor in Germany. He wanted to be a country doctor in the States. He, he, he liked it better, and he felt also he owed it to go where he was useful and not go to the Fourth Reich in upper Manhattan. So we found, he found a, uh, a very large population that had no medical service. It was the St. Regis Indian pop, uh, uh, Reservation on the St. Lawrence River. So we moved up to, this is not a joke, to Bombay, New York. It wasn't named after the Indians there. It was named after the surveyor's wife in 1830. She'd been a missionary kid in Bombay. So we moved to Bombay, New York, population 180, uh, north of the Adirondack Mountains and directly south of Hudson Bay and, and Quebec. Uh, and so I grew up for the next four or five years in this, in this village. Uh, but finally, my father decided we were not getting an education. It was, you know, the school, I was, uh, the entire high school was one room. 
and by the time we left, I was, I'd finished my sophomore year in high school, and not much was happening. So he found a practice in the Finger Lakes, still a pretty small town, Canandaigua. And we moved there, and I finished high school there. And then from then on, it was a pretty normal development. I went to Cornell University, and then straight on to Cornell Law School, because that was right after World War II, and they were pushing people through fast. Uh, if you were willing and you had been accepted, they would skip, you could skip your fourth year of undergraduate education and still get the bachelor's. So I started law school in the, summer, in the fall of 1949, which was really my fourth year in, uh, uh, in the undergraduate period, and then went through law school there. If you look back at your education, your intellectual growth in, in this country, do you think that having been born in Germany and the immigrant experience made a difference? In some ways, the immigrant experience did make a difference uh, in, my, in my, I wouldn't exactly say choice, but in the affinity group that I got into at Cornell, it was very heavily uh, fellow emigres, other Jewish students, not necessarily emigres, and especially with a lot of emigre faculty. It's interesting, you know, uh, uh, and not necessarily German Jews. My, my biggest uh, uh, influence was actually Vladimir Nabokov, who came in 1948 as a professor of Russian literature, and I became very close there. I had studied Russian uh, at Cornell, and so I was in his Russian language seminar. Uh, that was a very big influence. Um, Lange, uh, Oscar, not Oscar, that's somebody else, Fritz Lange, I think, who was a Germanist, Goethe specialist, was there at the time. That was important. And Erich Kahler, uh, who was a kind of political theorist, philosopher, uh, a classicist, really. He, he wrote Man the Measure, a sort of an anti-Platonic screed. Well, not a screed, it's a very serious book. Uh, he was quite influential. Uh, so it was a little bit of this milieu, you know, that uh, was not necessarily uh, conscious, but I found it comfortable. Of course. Berkeley, yeah. That's okay yeah. with you. Um, so, if you could start from um, how it came that you yeah. arrived at Berkeley, what, what brought you here, who brought you here, what brought you here, and, uh, and whether the kind of background you just described is something that you saw. Yeah. Also. Uh, getting to Berkeley uh, as a faculty member was really a lucky accident because in my third year law school, uh, a law school friend of mine had come to Berkeley as a so-called teaching assistant. They did first year research training for law students. And he wrote me and said, this is great, you got to come. So I applied, I got it. My draft board wouldn't let me take it because it was still Korean War. But uh, at that point, then, the dean at the law school said, well, you can take the LLM program. That's a degree program. I'd already committed to it, so I came to do that. And that year, only a year, led, though, to a, to a, you know, a real desire, if I could possibly do it, to get back to Berkeley. So then come nine years of military service and law practice. But I got an inquiry from Berkeley in uh, the fall of 1960. And, uh, I was not a good bargainer. I didn't even know what they were offering before I said yes, that I would come. And then I got here to start teaching in the fall of 1961. So um, can you describe, uh, in, in this key, so in, in a way, how do you describe your involvement in, in, uh, when you were a student, uh, but whether the, the milieu that you yeah. frequented here in Berkeley whether you saw the same kind of people, or how, you know, how the immigrant yeah. experience uh, changed your life yeah. in Berkeley. My, my background was really not Jewish by faith or by practice. It was really just, as Reinhard Bendix once said, Jewish by fate. Yeah. And so I wouldn't say that I was looking for a Jewish milieu, but 
the two faculty members with whom I was most uh, uh, comfortable, I, that's the wrong word, with whom I had a lot of extra reasons to have conversations and so on were the two emigres, uh, Steve Riesenfeld and Albert Ehrenzweig. In fact, I was a research assistant for Steve Riesenfeld on his book on creditors' remedies. On the other hand, uh, my, my professional training really came from uh, a man named Dick Jennings. Uh, I got very interested in corporation law and that kind of material. And so I wrote a master's thesis on a very dull subject in corporation law, but that was the entry point for me nine years later in 1961 uh, to get here. So I, of course, then was with this faculty. Uh, it was a very collegial uh, faculty. Uh, so I wouldn't say that the fact that there were two emigres uh, on the faculty was a huge thing, but I spent a lot of social time with both of them, and I got to know a lot of the emigre uh, faculty around the campus. Now part of that came because I got involved as a defense counsel with the free speech movement, which began in 1964. And I have to say, that for the older generation of German-speaking Jewish emigres or political emigres, this was a very difficult thing to, to assimilate. Uh, Karl Landauer, a wonderful, wonderful political scientist who had written the history of the socialist uh, movements in Europe, uh, I remember conversations with him where what he saw mostly were the mobs, you know, and of course it, it for him, it was a direct experience of the 30s and even the late 20s because there were a lot, the student movements in Germany were, were very difficult for Jews. I mean, and, no, and that was before Hitler. That started really after World War I already. <coughs> so so um, he had difficulties with it. Reinhard Bendix, who was one of the great people we had here. One of the complicated uh, relationships with the emigre community for me here, the older generation, was the uh, rise of the free speech movement. People like Karl Landauer, a magnificent political scientist, he'd written the history of the socialist movements in Europe uh, and a greatly respected member of the department. He saw these developments in, that, in the fall of 1964 more from the standpoint of the mobs as he, and he, I remember talking with him about that. Then from the standpoint of the subject matter and so forth, you know, it simply was a, uh, a very visceral reaction to the kind of experiences he and others like him had had in Germany during the 1920s. And of course then, to the degree they were still there during the 1930s. Reinhard Bendix, who's a giant in uh, sociology, uh, actually, and with whom uh, I was quite close. In fact, we lived uh, uh, across the street from each other for a few years. Uh, he actually moved from the Department of Sociology, which he found much too uh, uh, leftist, not in the classic sense, but in the sense of being too soft on these dangerous movements, right? and moved to the Department of Political Science. Louis Foyer left the philosophy department and moved to Toronto and uh, wrote about it afterwards. Uh, these were difficult issues for some of these people, and oddly enough, I got to know them, if anything, a little more because of our, uh, I wouldn't say tense, but because of our discussions of these issues. I was one of the five defense counsel. I was uh, in, in sync with what they were after, uh, the students. You know, I uh, represented them, and that was a little bit hard uh, in, in this context. Now, interestingly, at the law school, even though both Riesenfeld and Ehrenzweig were quite uh, centrist, right, uh, they understood that better. It may be something about the professional uh, background. They certainly didn't take my representing the students in any way against me. I, I shouldn't say the others did either, but uh, they, di they didn't have these arguments or these, these difficult discussions. Uh, with me. Uh, so that was a complication, but it also made for a lot more uh, campus-wide uh, involvement for me. I got involved at that time with the Institute of International Studies, as it was called. Ernie Haas, another great political scientist, emigre from Frankfurt, uh, was involved in that. Uh, so 
these political movements, and of course they morphed, I mean the, the free speech movement morphed directly into the anti-Vietnam uh, uh, movement where there was more support from uh, these people. I mean that was, uh, that was a much more uh, uh, general anti-war movement on campus. It didn't split right and left very much. It was simply seen as a wrong, as a wrong war. Uh, then uh, the third round morphed into the affirmative action problems, and I, I, was, I should say I was counsel for the draft resistors in the free speech in the uh, Vietnam War movement, and then I became counsel for a lot of the defendants. This is now what we call minority students, especially African American, Latino, and some Asian in the affirmative, uh, the third world strike, as it was called, which started in early 1969 to open the university to affirmative action for incoming students. Now that was a little rough because it was a sort of a waterfront brawl kind of situation. And um, I got a lot of heat from everybody, had nothing to do with the emigre crowd, for representing these roughnecks. You know, of course, they had been totally overcharged by the, by the DA's office, and uh, they were all charged with felonies, which was absurd. Uh, and it took some doing to, to uh, get that stuff reduced and sort of washed out finally, you know, from, from the uh, criminal system. But I spent uh, from 1964 to 1972, mostly a lot of it in court. And as I said, the hardest part in relation to your issues about the emigrant community here was the first one. The second was not hard. The third one was hard to everybody because I didn't like the, ru the roughneck stuff. Uh, it was okay when it was nice middle class behavior, but when it got to having fist fights and fights with picket sticks and so on, like on the waterfront, uh, that was a little difficult for the faculty. Looking back at your involvement with all of these student movements and civil uh, rights, how much do you think, I, you know, I, I don't know where you want to go in, in terms of uh, quantifying it in, 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 let's say, in ethical terms. Um, how much do you think your own uh, also direct knowledge of uh, the Turkish and you know, of, uh, essentially institutional abuse over, in, over individuals informed your involvement, your political involvement? I'm not sure, I, I'm the last person to ask about that, but I'm not sure that my history made that a very central factor in my choices. To some degree, I drifted into this kind of work. Uh, in the case of the free speech movement, it was because some of my law students got uh, picked up during the famous Sproul Hall occupancy. And so I was asked to go out and bail them out, and then I was asked to go and help them in the first preliminary rounds and so forth. Now the, the Vietnam War, yes, I would say that the Third Reich was an object lesson to some degree in these misadventures that we were engaged in. But you know, they're not very directly uh, comparable in that sense. And as for the affirmative action, Yes, uh, I, I, I would find some feeling there about the exclusion, you know, in, in the uh, German system of Jews and others, and this exclusion of uh, minorities, because there were sort of similar undertones, nothing of the viciousness, of course, but there were some undertones of they're not us. You know, they're not like us, and we're uncomfortable. Here. Now, there was no government policy except strict neutrality, which is, of course, a huge difference from a government policy that sets quotas and, and excludes uh, qualified people. Right? So you can't, you can't make a comparison in that sense. But the sense of uh, distancing yourself from another type of person, there was a little bit of that. I wouldn't overplay it. I think by then I was just so much into this stuff that uh, it, uh, I was not very deeply thinking about it. You know, Frank Zappa once said that if you understand the significance of something while you're in it, then you're not experiencing it. And I can say I must have been experiencing it because I didn't understand the significance of it while I was in it. There are 
give you a few names and collect yeah. uh, memories. Um, as I uh, uh, stayed here and as we got into the 70s and 80s, of course, uh, a lot of this emigre generation became closer to me, even if they were some of them, the generation of my father. You know, you, the rel it relativizes after a while. And some of the people who were uh, very important to me actually came here rather late. For example, um, two in particular, David Daube and uh, Fritz or Friedrich Kessler. David uh, was a, the Regis Professor of Roman Law at Oxford. And so when he came here, he came in a very senior lateral position to the law school. And he came for personal reasons, and he was much missed uh, at Oxford. He was simply a magnificent person, a, a larger-than-life figure. He was uh, uh, raised Orthodox. He was still somewhat observant. Uh, but to give you an idea of his charisma, uh, can you imagine a lecture on Roman law, that is to say a course on Roman law at the modern American law schools, which would have an enrollment of 120 students? Well, his did. Uh, it, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was a course on Roman law through the lens of a David Dauber. You know, it's, it's hard to describe the, 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 the humor. You know, he was a very sly, in, in the sense of intellectually sly, witty type of person. Fritz Kessler was a very uh, a, a different type. He, had also, he also came, in fact, he came after he reached emeritus status at Yale Law School. He was not Jewish, but he was married uh, to Eva Kessler, who was born Lehmann from the old Berlin Jewish family, very well-known family, uh, known in the United States, too, uh, in the sense of the New York Lehman brothers of late notoriety. And um, he left with her. Uh, he wouldn't stay. He wouldn't divorce her. He, he moved. So he came to the United States uh, fairly early. He was a different type, a very slow-speaking, profound person not so much witty as simply thinking deeply and very impressive, for example, in the way you could ask him a question, including in class, and he could sit for 10, 15, 20 seconds, perfectly comfortable while thinking through what he was going to say, while the class dissolved in agony. You know, it was very interesting. And then he would come with wonderful, wonderful, material. You know, he, he, he was really a contract specialist, but on the public policies implicit in a modern capitalist system where contracts are uh, honored and obeyed and so forth. Just a very, very rich in this comparative law tradition. The other two at the law school who were here when I came were, of course, Albert Ehrenzweig from Vienna and Steve Riesenfeld from Berlin. And they were my teachers when I was here as an LLM student. They became colleagues. Uh, we were just very deeply involved with each other. And uh, I grew close to them simply because of the long uh, relationship that started in the student-teacher sense. Uh, different people, but brilliant in, uh, in both cases. There, there isn't enough of record on them here, except maybe at the law school, you know, the, the larger uh, I don't think, for example, that an oral history was taken uh, from either one, which was a pity. They were, they were quite interesting. Uh, Steve's father fell in World War I. His father was already a converted Jew, Lutheran, um, and he and his twin brother grew up then with the mother. He came early to the United States. His twin brother never made it out, survived the war, but you know, in, not in a very good uh, situation or condition. Uh, Albert uh, was also already in a converted Catholic household, I think it was. They, they were uh, very interested in comparative law because of their background. And if I have a specialty within my general business law field, it is in the comparative area, and that's purely related to three people, Steve, Albert, and then at Cornell, another emigre, uh, Rudy Schlesinger, who oddly enough moved to Hastings afterwards, so we continued a good relationship uh, here. The others were more from other departments whom I got to know as we moved more and more into new European studies programs. 
you know, Landau or Hans Rosenberg, who really should, uh, should be better known. He was a mentor of many American historians of German history. Uh, Gunter Stent was an interesting fellow in molecular and cell biology. Uh, he uh, was about, I would say, six to eight years older than I was, but he, he was in the U.S. Army a month after the capitulation, he entered Berlin, and his stories of that chaotic era, you know, were really very, very important to many of us who, of course, had lost relatives there or who were trying to find people there, and his sense of how um, this chaos slowly resolved into the post-war uh, period was just very interesting. Uh, uh, a, a rather complicated man, uh, and of course a scientist, uh, not, I mean in the pure sense, not a political or historian or sociologist. And there was one other wonderful person here, Walter Friedlander. Walter had been the, uh, the social welfare senator in Berlin, in the Weimar Republic. Uh, he had introduced an enormous number of public welfare benefits, for example, for nursing mothers, for the poor. He had established uh, a lot of the uh, social services structures uh, that became a model within Weimar Germany. I mean, he was a senior uh, a social welfare policymaker in Germany, and he was unceremoniously kicked out. But uh, the new school of social welfare in Berkeley was uh, smart enough to hire him. And he really became the teacher of probably 20, I'm not kidding, 20 generations of the new American social service and social welfare uh, communities. Uh, there is a great story there in Walter. He was a guy, he may have been five foot tall, maybe five foot one, depending on his shoes, and uh, sort of a pixie-ish. Uh, uh, guy. Uh, there is a Walter Friedlander Memorial Lecture at the School of uh, Social Welfare, and they've had some very good people come, including from Europe, to, uh, to uh, give those lectures and to reflect on his influence in post-war Germany. That's also interesting. So there were a few very good people here. And then, of course, the, the uh, sort of the, the most in interesting one in, in, a certain, in a different sense, was Walter, Walter uh, uh, was uh, Max Knight, not Walter, Max Knight. Can you start that sentence again? Yes. One of the most, uh, one of the most interesting people in a different sense. Because I was talking over you. All right. One of the most interesting people in a different sense was Max Knight. He was the deputy editor of UC Press. He did something that I didn't think was humanly possible. He translated Christian Morgenstern's poems into English and they were as good as the German. And, and basically, they're untranslatable there. They are puns, riddles, anagrams, very interesting stuff. But he was also a very serious editor. Uh, Hans Kelsen, whom I haven't mentioned, but who uh, came to Berkeley in 1947, practically already at emeritus uh, stage, um, was uh, writing on uh, post-war Marxism. Uh, that was not his main field. His main field was positive law, theories of positive law. Uh, and Max was his editor. And uh, Max took that very seriously, and uh, it resulted in a very serious manuscript, which uh, Hans, whom I knew quite well, uh, withdrew because he was a bit fearful that it was going to raise some of the uh, post-war, Cold War uh, uh, issues again, which it wouldn't have, but that was his uh, fear. But Max was both a very serious editor, in other words, a, a significant contributor to the UC Press system, and then this very playful, witty guy. I once asked him um, why he had changed his name to Max Knight. It hadn't been his original name. And he said, well, I had all these monogrammed handkerchiefs. You know, I, I would, what could I have done with them if I hadn't uh, found an M and a K? And then I said, although I was wrong on this, I thought his name was Max Koenig. Uh, it actually was Koenig, so it wasn't quite the same. But he didn't disabuse me of that. I said, but look, Max King would work, MK. He said, Dick, I wouldn't be so presumptuous in this country. <laughs> you know? And that was his style. He was, uh, 
He was a marvelous, marvelous man. It was a great generation, very different. And uh, a lot of us who came more or less as children, that is, I don't mean literally that, but Ernie Haas, John Prausnitz, uh, 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 Grunewald, uh, uh, no, Eric Grun, I'm thinking of another Grunewald, Eric Grun, uh, people like that. We just benefit, all of us, we benefited from this, uh, from this older group. And that isn't even mentioning the scientists among them, whom some of, I, I knew a few fleetingly, but not, not in any deep way. I think I have two more questions. One has to do with looking back at Europe and your relationship with, uh, with Germany. One of the great benefits to me, but I think also to others who were more or less in my age cohort, maybe like Ernie Haas, John Prausnitz, Eric Grun, uh, Tom Rosenmeier, uh, was we benefited, in my view, you'd have to ask them about this, but in my view, we benefited greatly from having this older generation here. Uh, it was a comfortable group to be with. They widened our horizons. They kept us connected you know, to uh, the European scene. And from many of us worked on European matters, so that was very important. Ernie Haas, after all, was the father of the political science work on the European economic community. And it was, it was a, a milieu that was, I believe, deeper at Berkeley than at most other uh, universities of this size. And one reason is that the university made a very conscious effort to rise from being a very good regional university to a world university by being much more open to the hiring of emigre scholars starting in the early 30s than most other universities. The struggles that some of their peers went through at Eastern schools, I know a few, uh, I, I don't want to do the names of the people, but I'll tell you, Michigan, Harvard, Columbia were very different. Uh, they, they, were, uh, they, were, they had a harder road to hoe to get in. There were people, for example, one of the great, I will mention this, one of the great German law scholars, Arthur Nussbaum, he had been actually the doctor father for Steve Riesenfeld, uh, at Columbia Law School, never, uh, yes, he was there, he had a position, he probably had security of employment, but he was never again uh, in the context that we would have had a Riesenfeld or an Ernstweig. Right? Ernst Wabel went to Michigan and basically was a hired hand doing research. You know, there was too much of that. And, and Berkeley in particular, but some of the UC system in addition, uh, you might say they, it was a two-way benefit. You know, they benefited from the additional uh, level that some of these, that these people brought in. And of course, it was a wonderful home for those fleeing. My relation to Germany is uh, not, not uh, off the spectrum, but it's on the uh, part of the spectrum that found it quite comfortable after a while of getting back into uh, relationships with post-war Germany. A lot of that came, comes from the fact that I came from a mixed marriage, right? I, my mother's family had suffered almost as much. They lost uh, uh, two brothers in the wars. Uh, my cousin, whom I was very close to on that side, was a seminarian, Catholic seminarian. He refused to become a chaplain. He was sent into a penal battalion and was killed two days after he arrived at the Russian front. A lot of that kind of thing. So going, and then of course I was back uh, in the U.S. Army in Germany for uh, over three years, starting in mid-1954. Uh, I. I, the, the, the people we had grown up with in Griesheim and in Friedberg, the, we knew them, we were comfortable with them, we knew their political background, we knew what they'd gone through. For me, it was not too difficult uh, getting, again, uh, comfortable with them. Uh, it was helped by the fact that my father, while he would never return there, 
uh, was very helpful to these groups already right after World War II. Uh, so we were, we were pre, uh, predisposed, maybe the wrong word, but I was ready for this. I married a German woman, not immediately then, but later, so we had a continuing connection through the in-laws. Uh, I started teaching uh, in Germany as early as 1965-66. For I was a full year in Cologne at that time. Uh, one of my older, uh, 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 my older child, my daughter, was born in Germany. Her older daughter was born in Germany when she was over there as a lawyer uh, for a New York law firm. So it's interesting how that continued. And in general. Uh, we had a very good relationship at uh, Berkeley, and particularly at the law school with Germany, because of a rather odd but interesting um, uh, specific bit of history. The Ford Foundation in the mid-1950s decided to increase the international legal relation strength of American law faculties, which they thought correctly were too parochial. So they put a competition out and provided, and 14 law faculties got very significant money. Berkeley uh, took a unique path, and they got this money. They decided to create a jumelage with a university at which the dean was a very good post-war, politically sound person, Gerhard Kegel at Cologne. Cologne's a kind of a, uh, interesting law faculty, but at that time, that was a very interesting connection. So we started, we used our money by bringing over young German potential academics to do the comparative part of their dissertation and habilitation work here. We invited uh, German colleagues, but not only from Cologne, to be visiting professors. Riesenfeld and Ehrenzweig were constantly uh, in Germany, uh, work, uh, you know, teaching, working, and so forth. So the law school, Boat Hall, became uh, a real academic reproduction uh, uh, site uh, for, for Germany. And of course, then with people like Ernie Haas and others in the political science department, that created a very strong uh, political science relationship with Europe in general, Germany in particular. So that when in the late 80s, Chancellor Kohl decided he wanted to generate some support for German studies in the United States, which from his point of view were veering too much towards the Pacific, uh, he, he invited a group of university presidents uh, over to Bonn, and David Gardner was one of the ones invited. Uh, Dave, David uh, convinced him that if he was going, if the government was going to have this kind of serious support, it couldn't be just for a center of German studies. It would have to be for centers of European studies. And the compromise made was center for German and European studies, which is a little bit awkward when you think about where Germany sits, right? You would believe it is in Europe, but be that as it may, the idea was you could support German studies and you could support European studies, like European Union or cross-European. So I, I, I had written the, um, um, the, pro the project proposal for the university for the president, and we got it. And so uh, for my sins, I became then the first director of the Center for German and European Studies. Uh, and that was a very active center because one of the ways we used the money was to uh, encourage entering graduate students in the PhD programs uh, to consider German and European subject matter in their field of study. So we, we became an academic reproduction uh, site thanks to this German money, which was not trivial. It was a million and a half per year for 10 years. Uh, that's dollars. It wasn't euros at the start anyway. So we really were, uh, and of course it was, it was made for the whole university. It wasn't, it was centered at Berkeley. Berkeley got probably more than one ninth of the uh, uh, resources, but it was a university uh, situation. So Santa Barbara, uh, uh, LA, uh, UCLA, and San Diego also got the benefit of this new graduate uh, development. That was a very useful uh, uh, development. And I'm, I was really very pleased that we had this part in it. It was, uh, it started, 
it did keep, I think, the Pacific Coast uh, setting somewhat attuned uh, to Europe. You can't claim too much for it, but it helped. In your trajectory and in everything you've been telling us, there seems to be this uh, uh, holding before you uh, notions of the law and of the abuse of the law. And it seems like your career, your life, your concerns also are articulated uh, in this, uh, I don't know if it's even a dichotomy, but it's a, it's a tension. And uh, if, you, if you're interested in, in, in following my lead and, and where that could take you, that would be fantastic too. My, my uh, feelings about the role of law are not that centered, I think, on abuse of law. You know, my specialty is corporation law. You couldn't think of a more left brain boring subject than corporation law. Uh, and I would hardly say that my interest in comparative corporation law, you know, of Europe, of other countries, has much to do with abuse of law, except if management <laughs> abuses <laughs> the innocent shareholders. That is not uh, something that comes out of my background, in, in my European background in particular. Uh, there is a different way in which I think uh, this has played a role. I've always been interested in reparations. Uh, of course, we, as a family, we had some reparations issues of our own. I actually worked to some degree in the 90s for a, uh, a, a law firm in um, the United States that was representing some of the American and German companies which were defendants in the large class actions, although I, I would like to say that I only did that uh, once negotiations for settlement were, were uh, starting. I've written quite a bit about that topic. I was the U.S. commissioner um, in the U.S.-German um, uh, commission under the uh, Foundation for uh, Remembrance, Responsibility in the Future, which settled all those class actions, uh, and I was one. Uh, my German counterpart and I were with the Swiss chair. We were responsible for the uh, compensation claims of um, occupied country subjects whose productive enterprises had been taken from them. So I got deeply involved in, the, uh, in those issues again. And I suppose to some degree uh, that side of my law interests, of course, relates to my past and to my reflections on it. I can't claim too much of that, though, in the field of corporation law. I'd like to uh, be nice to you about that, but I don't think that subject lends itself to the issue you're raising. Yeah, you don't have to be nice to me. <laughs> my, my, my views about law are, in a sense, dichotomous, because on the one hand, my professional life has been on a very dull, subject that doesn't lend itself much to the issues that we've been discussing uh, here today. Corporation law is a left brain subject, I would say, even when you're talking about abuse of power by directors over, over shareholders. Where it shows up more, I think, is in my longstanding interest in the whole issue of post-war handling of the wartime situations. After all, on my father's side, we lost everyone with the exception of one cousin and it was a big, it was a big family. Uh, we had post-war uh, compensation and reparations issues around that in our own family. I got involved already uh, in the um, 80s in discussing with, uh, no, no, actually already earlier, in the late 60s, there was a big debate in Germany about the prolongation of the statute of limitations on murder because they had not yet finished all of the uh, 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 criminal cases uh, coming out of the Third Reich atrocities, uh, and there were still a lot of pending cases. And I was, in, uh, I was involved with a German colleague in Hamburg in providing evidence that on the, in the American scene, uh, these issues had also arisen in a highly political context, namely the Civil War. And so I wrote up some pretty extensive memoranda for their use in the parliament, in the German parliament, on this question. And the, and the statute was extended twice, not because of me, but I mean, there were a lot of other political reasons. 
to extend it. Then, uh, as the 80s morphed into the 90s, and especially with reunification, uh, a lot of these compensation issues came up again because, of course, the East Germans had not been uh, 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 had not had the benefit of re reparations and compensation from their own government. So I got more into that. The, uh, I, for a while, even worked uh, to give advice to a law firm that was uh, representing uh, a U.S. and German corporate defendants in some of these class actions because a settlement was coming. Uh, it was already sort of in the works at the time, and that interested me. Uh, so we, uh, we, I got involved a little bit in that, not very much, but some. Uh, but then I started writing about it, doing the research in it, archival work on the history of reparations. I've written a handful of articles on that. I'm still doing it. And uh, I also had the practical experience of being the U.S. commissioner uh, on the U.S.-German Claims Commission that was set up uh, to uh, administer this uh, 6.5 billion euro fund created to settle those class actions. M our part of it was a relatively small part. It was the property compensation. But that got you into, of course, all of these stories again. And I spent six years uh, on that commission. We, we, were, we handled 42,000 cases of, uh, because a lot of property taken during that era was in Poland for very small enterprises. Uh, you know, you, you think of the Bata Shoe Company or Skoda Works, but the bulk of what Germans seized and gave over to Germans who didn't have any other way to make a living during the war was these small farmsteads, small homesteads, sewing machine uh, establishments and so forth. And that really gets you thinking a lot about uh, how do you undo uh, this, these issues, and what role can the legal system play in this? It's a big debate today. You know, you look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on the one hand, you look at the demand for material compensation on the other, you look at the issues in, in uh, Iraq with the uh, expulsion of the Arabs from the Kurdish area, you look at it in the uh, Gulf War, you even look at the Palestinian issues about the wall for which Israel, in principle, has a compensation system. There is a lot going on in which the law plays a large role. In fact, I've taught many years uh, short courses in Budapest at the Central European University. And for the last 10 years, my course has been on the implications of international human rights for corporations, uh, for the private sector actors. So yeah, I think there is a, a bit of a, of a uh, feedback to my past in that. So what we're trying to do with this uh, project is uh, we're trying to bring forth a whole history of the campus, but of its relations to, to Europe and to kind of global matters. And we're doing it by connecting uh, first generation of emigrant scholars to uh, scholars who are studying them and to students. So we're doing this, you know, this, uh, it's, it, there's a bit of a strategy here, right? Uh, we're discovering the past again, we're rediscovering the past, bringing it forth, and connecting the various generations of, uh, of uh, yeah. campus life. Can you tell us what, how you feel about it? I put this project into a context that includes, of course, the events, the tragedies that led to the fact that you have a Berkeley project about emigre scholars. Uh, I shouldn't poach on Marty, Marty Jay's field, but I've always liked this comment by Eric Hobsbawm in one of his uh, books. Uh, he says that uh, between every lived experience and the cold record of history, there is a twilight zone in which the experience of those who lived the original event is shaped and changed by their life after the event. And I put what you're doing into a kind of closure of that twilight zone. That is, you are looking now at the period after the events and how not so much I as a younger person, but how the older generation experienced that 
set of events through their lives afterwards at Berkeley and uh, at other institutions. And look at some of the dates. Uh, the one I think is most interesting is a very trivial one maybe, but nonetheless worth thinking about. The German compensation statute provides pension payments to those who were uh, expelled from government positions, from public sector positions, I should say, by reason of the persecutions, and to their uh, surviving spouses. And uh, people like Steve Riesenfeld, who was for a couple of years an assessor in Germany and therefore was a public official in, uh, in the sense of a public servant, and had paid into the public uh, uh, pension scheme and was kicked out, right, received after the war, he bought his way back in, but you could do it many ways, received a pension uh, for the rest of, uh, after he was of retirement age, for the rest of his life. And his widow, who only died a few years ago, was receiving it too. Well, I was in Berlin uh, talking to one of the finance ministry people uh, last year in part, as a part of an archival research I'm doing. And I said, actuarially speaking, uh, does the finance Depart uh, ministry have a sense of when that program uh, uh, will finish or is it finished? And he told me as well, under the law, any surviving spouse who was born before May something 1945, right, uh, receives this pension. So to the extent that there were second marriages with relatively young spouses by some of these uh, expelled uh, 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 public uh, uh, civil servants, they would continue. And we have it all, we have it actuarially figured out. We believe that our budget for this will end in, in, 19, in the year 2037 because they know the age of some of the uh, widows mostly, of course all I think, uh, receiving this money. So from Hobsbawm's point of view, I think 2037, which incidentally is the 100th anniversary of the end of the old German Reich before its expansion into the Sudetenland, right? Uh, it was, it's sort of the last part there. Uh, 2037 may be the capstone and from then on it's a cold record of history. So I'm very happy that you're recording it now during the Twilight Zone. I'm a bit older than the others that you are uh, recording, Lecure, Jay, and so forth. So I'm a little more of a bridge to the actual previous experiences, of course. But it seems to me uh, quite uh, uh, fruitful and important even that these recordations, these, these stories of the life of the emigres in Berkeley but also the way to which they were shadowed by their lives uh, as adults in the Third Reich uh, come into the record of this university. It's a, a good project to record what Hobsbawm calls the twilight zone that exists between the lived experiences and the cold record of history. And you're contributing, I think, to the richness of later generations' understanding of that long period between the events that led to what we have at Berkeley, to the life that was led at Berkeley uh, after their arrival, and what will happen in future generations.